Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we are going to talk about lower back pain, which is of course extremely common and something that you are going to deal with throughout your entire career. So before we get into some of the more serious etiologies of back pain, let's take a look at some non-specific lower back pain. So the main goal when evaluating patients with non-specific lower back pain is making sure you're not missing a serious condition that might be manifesting itself as back pain. So we'll look at those more serious conditions shortly. But on physical exam, you might find things like tenderness to palpation of the back's musculature. The paraspinal muscles may be abnormal, but there shouldn't be any signs of radiculopathy or of spinal cord compression. The straight leg raise test should also be negative, and that tells us there's no nerve compression in the lumbar region. So you'll find that the physical exam is benign. Now, in these cases, if there are no red flags, which we'll discuss on the next slide, no lab work is indicated. Now, there are going to be a large number of patients who present with nonspecific lower back pain every year, and the vast majority of cases or causes will be musculoskeletal pain, and it will resolve within four to six weeks without any intervention. For this reason, you really want to avoid any unnecessary imaging, and therefore only patients at an elevated risk for one of the serious conditions involving the back would need immediate imaging. So if there's a risk of spinal cord involvement as manifested on history or physical exam by new, progressive, and or severe neurologic deficits like weakness or loss of bowel or bladder control, then immediate imaging is warranted. Patients with signs of possible malignancy as a cause of lower back pain, which would show up with unintentional weight loss, maybe fever, night sweats, back pain that worsens at night, or even just a history of malignancy, would also require imaging right away. Now, imaging is also warranted if there's a suspected infection involving the back, either of the bone in osteomyelitis or even a spinal epidural abscess, for example. Now, some red flags for these conditions include recent bacterial infections, IV drug use, or recent epidural or spinal or spinal procedures that would have just directly introduced bacteria right into that epidural space. Patients who are over 50 years of age are also more likely to have these serious causes, such as malignancy, of course, as compared to a 30-year-old, for example. And finally, if after conservative management, the patient shown no improvement after that four to six week time period, then imaging would be warranted. Now, non-urgent back pain typically warrants conservative management, so what constitutes conservative management? Well, the first line treatment would be NSAIDs for two to four weeks. If that's not effective in managing the pain, then acetaminophen, muscle relaxants, or as a last resort, a very brief course of opioids could be considered. But NSAIDs are always going to be your first line. Now, moving on to lumbosacral radiculopathy. This is caused by anything that can result in compression of the nerve roots as they exit the spine. And this is commonly going to be due to a herniated disc degenerative spinal stenosis that causes compression of the nerve root, or a less common cause such as primary cancer or bone metastasis, or even epidural hematomas or abscesses. Now, radiculopathy, no matter where it occurs in the body, is usually characterized by pain that is sharp and shooting in nature, typically radiating and may also present with paresthesias like numbness or tingling, as well as sensory, motor, or reflex losses. Now, the straight leg test is often positive in patients with radicular pain and may replicate the shooting pain down the leg that they reported in their history. Now, the most common lumbosacral radiculopathies include L5 radiculopathy and S1 radiculopathy. So let's just take a minute to go over those symptoms. So L5 radiculopathy would present with um, lower back pain with radiation to the lateral leg and into the foot. On exam, a patient may have diminished strength with foot dorsiflexion, inversion, and eversion, and they may have sensory loss to the lateral portion of the lower leg and the dorsum of the foot. S1 radiculopathy will cause buttock pain radiating to the posterior aspect of the leg and foot. Now, this may also potentially demonstrate a loss of ankle reflex, possible diminishment in strength in foot plantar flexion, uh, knee flexion, as well as sensory loss over the posterior aspect of the leg and the lateral edge of the foot. Although less common, S2, S3, S4 radiculopathies will typically also involve buttock pain that radiates to the posterior leg or into the perineum, and this can result in urinary and fecal incontinence as well as sexual dysfunction. The L2, L3, L4 radiculopathies can cause lower back pain that radiates down the anterior thigh, over the knee, and then down the medial lower leg and over the arch of the foot. Now, the knee reflex here could be reduced, and there might be weakness in hip flexion, adduction, and knee extension. Again, 
These lumbosacral radiculopathies are much less common, but testing you on these radiculopathies could be a good way to test your knowledge of nerve distribution, so don't be surprised if you do see something like this. Now, imaging is warranted urgently in cases where neoplasm or epidural abscesses are suspected, as well as if the patient's experiencing worsening neurologic deficits, or if the symptoms are bilateral, uh, if the patient has urinary retention, saddle anesthesia, all of which are signs of permanent neurological damage without intervention. Okay? Oftentimes, imaging won't be needed as this diagnosis can be made clinically. Now, the imaging modality of choice here is going to be an MRI, but if imaging doesn't identify the cause, an EMG and nerve conduction studies can be performed to determine if a radiculopathy is in fact present. And you need to wait at least three weeks from the onset of symptoms, otherwise muscle and nerve changes from that radiculopathy won't be picked up on these electrodiagnostic tests. So the diagnosis of lumbosacral radiculopathy is a clinical diagnosis, so you do not need to confirm the diagnosis with imaging or, um, and or electrodiagnostic testing until the patient fails conservative management or if, of course, they have signs of serious progressive disease. Now, conservative management would include EDSEDs, acetaminophen, uh, activity modification, as well as physical therapy. If four weeks of conservative management fails to improve the symptoms, then patients can undergo diagnostic testing with neuroimaging, and we can, at that point, consider epidural glucocorticoid injections or even surgical intervention. All right, let's move on now to lumbar spinal stenosis. This is a narrowing of either the central canal, the lateral recess, or the neural foramen. Lateral recess and neural foraminal stenosis symptomatically will typically present as lumbosacral radiculopathy like we just discussed. Now, this is usually caused by spondylosis, which is the degeneration of the spine over time. This means that this most commonly affects elderly individuals. Now, lesions such as tumors or diseases causing bone overgrowth could also be a possible cause of lumbar spinal stenosis. Now, the symptoms here to note include neurogenic claudication, sometimes called pseudoclaudication. This presents as pain that's induced by activity or standing with an erect posture and relieved when sitting or flexing at the waist. Um, as for radiculopathies, multiple focal weaknesses and or areas of sensory loss are noted because several nerve roots are affected. Cauda equina could also be seen, and this will symptomatically appear as bilateral leg weakness and possible bowel and or bladder dysfunction, as well as possible erectile dysfunction. So let's take a closer look at cauda equina syndrome, which occurs when the nerve roots of the cauda equina become compressed. And there are many potential causes of the syndrome, including epidural abscess, hematoma, tumor, intervertebral disc herniation, lumbar spine spondylosis, or really anything else that can compress the cauda equina could cause this syndrome. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of a compressed cauda equina? Well, radicular lower back pain, saddle anesthesia, bladder and bowel dysfunction, as well as a loss of lower extremity motor function, sensations, and reflexes. All of these symptoms are seen in cauda equina syndrome. When a patient presents this way, you want to immediately obtain imaging to confirm the presence of some sort of pathology causing cauda equina compression and identify exactly what is causing that compression, meaning we are looking for an abscess, we're looking for a tumor, etc. Labs will really depend on the cause here. Now, they could be normal if we're dealing with disc herniation or lumbar spine spondylosis. Uh, we could see elevated white blood cells if we're dealing with an epidural abscess. We could see anemia if a neoplasm is a problem. Uh, elevated ESR should also be suspected if there's an inflammatory condition. All right? It really just depends on what's causing the problem. The diagnosis is based on history and physical exam findings, plus imaging that's actually showing cauda equina compression. Now, treatment is going to depend on the cause. Antibiotics would be used for infection, steroids for inflammatory cases, chemotherapy, and radiation for neoplasms. Next up, let's take a look at osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. Now, these are low trauma fractures, and these occur when a patient falls from a standing height or lower, or reports back pain following coughing, uh, going over speed bumps, or any other event that puts a small amount of stress on the vertebra. Now, this level of trauma in a person without bone pathology would not cause any type of fracture. Oftentimes, there actually might not be any trauma at all. So this low-level trauma or lack of trauma means there's something wrong, all right? Now, these compression fractures usually occur at the level of T7 to T8 or T12 to L1, and the pain is usually identified as being in the spine, and there shouldn't be any radiation of pain into the legs, except in the very rare case of a bone fragment causing spinal cord or nerve root compression. So you want to watch for a loss of height with this type of fracture, as well as the presence of pain on palpation over spinous processes or the nearby paravertebral structures. 
Now, if you suspect an osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture, the diagnosis should be confirmed with plain radiography. Now, when it comes to this type of fracture, keep in mind that there are a few different shapes of vertebral compression fractures that can occur, including a biconcave deformity, a wedge fracture, or a compression fracture. These are all just different shapes that the vertebra can take, so you want to be sure to recognize them if they're described to you um, in a vignette. Now, treatment includes pain control with NSAIDs, acetaminophen, or opioids. Uh, which modality you choose really depends on the severity, and we also want to reduce the risk of fractures moving forward. We're going to do that by giving the patient bisphosphonates for long-term management. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question. I will put 20 seconds on the clock. Go ahead, figure this out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is A. Next question, I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need a little more time, hit the pause button. Once you've got it figured out, come on back. Correct answer here is D. And your final question, I'll put 20 seconds on the clock, but if you need more time, hit that pause button. Once you got it figured out, come on back. Correct answer here is A. All right, that ends this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.